I will stick to the to six main criticisms that would equally apply to all of them to show why the Austrian theory of the business cycle is completely wrong. Anru, how can you have been YouTubing for so long and still be completely crap at what you do? They all rely upon the Wixellian idea of a natural interest rate, which means that there's one interest rate that if you went below, you would cause malinvestment. In other words, it would be damaging to the economy. Except the problem is there is no natural interest rate. All of economics, every single school, shows that there's an equilibrium interest rate as a result of supply and demand in the loanable funds market. Lenders are willing to lend more money at higher interest rates, and borrowers are willing to borrow more at lower interest rates. Where the two curves cross, you have the equilibrium interest rate and the equilibrium quantity of loanable funds. What the Austrian school shows, which you don't even cover, is that when money is injected into the loanable funds market by the central bank, it causes malinvestment because investment money no longer comes solely from delayed gratification. Ordinarily, lenders lend money instead of engaging in whatever consumption of resources that amount of money would allow them to do. By lending that money out, they delay that consumption, and those resources can be used elsewhere. But when the central bank injects money, it results in a lower interest rate, meaning that these lenders are not lending that extra money. They're consuming it, and borrowers are still borrowing it, meaning that both of them are trying to grab the same amount of resources in the economy, and there just isn't enough to go around. You can maintain the illusion that there is for a while, and that's the boom, but eventually everything's gonna hit the fan, and that's the bust. See, this is easy to explain, so why can't you even understand the basics? And why should anyone even listen to you when you can't even get the basics of a theory right? It also relies on the premise that unregulated monetary interest rate would be able to communicate enough information for time preference, which is absolutely false. Well, how else are you going to do it? Interest rates rise when more loanable funds are needed. In other words, when people aren't saving as much, but a lot of people are wanting to borrow. Interest rates drop when fewer people want to borrow, but more people want to save. If you understand that, then you can see how time preference gets communicated. Interest rates rise when investment money is more desperately needed for short-term projects. Interest rates lower when things aren't so desperate, and investors can focus on long-term projects. It can't do that. In fact, I don't see how it could communicate really any information in that regards whatsoever. Then you're a moron! What is the price mechanism other than a means of communication? And what is the interest rate if not the price of a loan? Now Hayek had two versions of this. His early one relied on the premise of a general equilibrium. Then the economy would leave that general equilibrium and then come back to it. Of course this is false because there is no general equilibrium as a starting point. Is all you're going to do just say not true because it's false over and over again? You're not debunking anything! You're just claiming that it's not true, and to back it up, you just claim that it doesn't exist! The other version of it also cannot exist, because it begins from a standpoint of full employment. Who wants to bet he doesn't understand what the term full employment means? And on top of that, even if there is full employment, which there never is and is actually not possible... Again, why is it not possible? He doesn't say. Even when the unemployment rate is extremely low, there is still idleness in many sectors of the economy. What does this even mean? The Austrian business cycle theory presupposes a full use of resources and a closed economy. No, it doesn't! First of all, if it did, it wouldn't have a business cycle. Second, it is very much based on the benefits of international trade and open economies. But mostly, what does the term full use of resources even mean? He seems to think that there's just one big pie and we're either using it all or we're not. He's ignoring the wealth creation that causes the pie to grow bigger. You can take copper and aluminum and rubber and use them to make plates, forks, and boots. Or, if you're in a wealthier economy, you can use them to make electronic devices. Same amount of resources, but a greater use of them. So how can there be any such thing as full use of resources when we're not even sure what the limits of our imagination are? 
The Austrian theories of capital surrounding the Austrian business cycle are wrong. They believe that the capital goods can be classified into strict orders separated from the consumer goods output. No, tons of capital goods can belong to multiple orders at the same time. No, Austrian denies this. Stop lying. And it doesn't have anything to do with ABCT anyway. Time preference is wrong. In loanable funds models that also exist in the Austrian business cycle theory are also wrong. Interest rates cannot give you enough information for time preference, nor can they give you enough information for the amount of resources available. Again, how else are you going to do it? The cycle theory relies on Mises' final state of rest or equilibrium. No! In fact, Mises' whole point is that this state can never be reached. Here's what Mises wrote in Part 4 of Human Action. This final state of rest is an imaginary construction, not a description of reality. For the final state of rest will never be attained. New disturbing factors will emerge before it will be realized. What makes it necessary to take recourse to this imaginary construction is the fact that the market at every instant is moving towards a final state of rest. Every later new instant can create new facts altering this final state of rest. But the market is always disquieted by a striving after a definite final state of rest. So preferences shift before any final state can be reached. People's wants change. Their desires are unlimited, so they start wanting new things. You've just said that Mises depended on something that he said can never happen. Really, this is no different than a creationist saying evolution can't happen because randomness can't make a life form, when evolution doesn't say that life forms are created at random. No difference. It also assumes the following things. Clearing of market prices, equalization of profits, and elimination of profits. Institutional complexity, uncertainty, and shifting expectations are all reasons why this doesn't happen in real life. As Mises said. But in the long term, there are administered prices, meaning companies do set a general equilibrium for their prices to ensure stability in their markets. That isn't what an equilibrium is, moron! It is assumed that prices move in a flexible response to demand changes. This supposedly brings in changes in money profits. This, in turn, is what is believed to cause malinvestments. I really wonder how this even makes sense to him while he's saying it. But I've already explained what causes malinvestment. This, in turn, is what is believed to cause malinvestments, as capitalists try to exploit unsustainable profit opportunities. I don't even know where to begin with that. Malinvestment is caused by false signals. Let's say you're in the corner of a high-rise office looking down at the intersection below. The light's green one way and red the other. Then the light changes and the traffic one way stops and the traffic in the other direction starts again. This keeps on for a while and everything's fine. Then something goes wrong and the lights turn green all four ways. Cars crash in the intersection and traffic backs up. Would you say that happened because greedy car drivers were trying to exploit an unsustainable opportunity? No! You know it happened because the traffic signals got messed up. Again, interest rates are there to manage the balance between borrowers and lenders. Since the interest rate is there to encourage lenders not to consume a certain amount of resources, but rather to invest them so someone else can do so for a larger rate of return later, the green light of lower interest rates means that they can grab up all of these resources because fewer people are using them. But like the green light all four ways, if those low interest rates are caused by money being artificially injected by the central bank, the resources they're trying to grab are already being grabbed by someone else. That's why everything goes wrong. The reality of the situation is quite different. Industrial and service industries have fixed prices. They are relatively inflexible. New demand only compels greater production and employment, not important price movements. I wonder how he thinks that can possibly be the case. How are they going to afford to increase production and hire more people? The overall general problem with the Austrian business cycle theory is that they're all based upon praxeological axioms. Those axioms are based on a presupposition that they cannot be wrong and that, in fact, you cannot verify or disqualify them. All right, Unruh, let me see if I can explain this so that even a blithering idiot like you can understand it. 
The praxeological axiom is simply that human beings act deliberatively to achieve a certain goal. Aside from a very few edge cases such as the extremely mentally ill, I don't really see how this can ever be false. All other praxeological principles derive logically from that axiom. If someone takes an action, it must be because he feels at the time that the costs of taking that action are outweighed by the value he gets from it. This does not mean that he's correct in that valuation. It doesn't mean that he's acting wisely or logically or that he's taking the most effective way or even an effective way of obtaining that desire. It just means that's why he's doing it. Also, actions take time. Some don't take very much time, but they all take some amount of time, and so actions are costs directed towards future attainment. Again, I don't see any way this can be denied unless you want to posit that every single one of a person's desires can be met instantaneously. So literally in Austrians' minds, what we really see with Austrian economics is I am right no matter what, and any empirical evidence that you show me that d demonstrates why this economic theory can never work, has never worked, and literally can't even exist, doesn't matter. It's more like showing a proof that 2 plus 2 equals 4 and saying you don't need physical evidence for it. Why would you? We're talking logical principles here. They will just explain it away as being caused by the state. We have mechanisms showing how they're caused by the state. I gave one that you keep ignoring, injection of money into the loanable funds market by the central bank. We see lots of others, like price controls such as minimum wage. You can't just dismiss all of that by pretending it doesn't exist. Now, there are many other subjects within uh, Austrian economics that I could go into. No, you couldn't, because you don't have the economic understanding of a moldy grape. What they're saying is not true. You haven't even shown you understand what the theory is, let alone even tried to show how it's wrong. Your whole argument has amounted to nothing more than is not, is not, is not. The overall problem with Austrian economics is that it's not economics. They don't demonstrate how something can even work, let alone how it can be better. They can't empirically prove anything they're saying, and there's huge logical loopholes in it. I've got links to a few Tom Woods lectures in the video description that show that this is laughably wrong. The fact is, if Austrian economics were false and socialism were true, the world, both as it is currently and throughout history, would look very different than it does now. Hey, thanks for watching! Please hit like and subscribe and keep these videos coming by donating, becoming a subscriber and getting special benefits, or even for free with their time. And check out all the great content here, like this video selected just for you!